Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. So the uh, title of my talk today is Taming the Wild West of Large Language Models. My goal is to try and lay the landscape of large language models and what it looks like and talk a little bit about the tools that are out there that can help us navigate this landscape. So this slide here shows a timeline of text-to-text -text foundation models that have been built and trained since GPT-3. So GPT-3 was released uh, mid-2020. It's been over three years. And as you can see, there are a lot more models being trained over the years. The symbols here indicate model access. So the cross indicates closed access, and the tick indicates open access. So what is this model access, and what are the types of model access? So model access is essentially a spectrum. On the extremes is open access, and you know, on the other extreme is closed access. And somewhere in the middle is something that we call limited access. So in open access model, the model components are publicly available. This includes open source code, training data such as the source of the data and their distribution, and the data pre-processing and curation steps that were taken. Uh, obviously, the model weights are accessible for downloading and you know, training it further. There's also usually a paper or blog that summarizes what architecture and the training details about the model. Um, evaluation results, did they do any kind of benchmarking? Well, what do the results look like? How does the model perform? Um, and if there was any adaptation to the model, for example, did they use any safety filters or did they train the model using human feedback? For example, RLHF, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. What are the advantages of open access model? Uh, open access models allow reproducing results and replicating parts of the models. It enables auditing and conducting risk analysis. This usually happens when the data set is also open and the source of the data is known. And obviously, open access models serve as research artifacts for researchers to study them, fine tune them further, benchmark them, and so on. Um, and it enables researchers to start interpreting why a model generated a certain output. On the other hand, closed access model only come with probably a research blog or a paper that may or may not include details about the training data, architecture and training details, including what kind of infra did they train the model on, um, evaluation results, and again, like adaptation to the models that they use, uh, RLHF or any safety filters. So why would model developers decide to keep, keep their model closed? One is that they are really genuinely concerned about safety and misuse of the model if they openly give access to it. It might also be that you know, it gives them, it's their moat and it gives them a competitive advantage over other model developers. Um, and suppose that they actually wanted to give access to the model to researchers to study them and benchmark them, it might usually be expensive to set up guardrails for safe access so that you know, only people who are given access are able to like, use it in a good way. So limited access models fall somewhere in the middle, in which case they are available for use via API or a call for research proposal. So you know, people, they put out a call and be like, you know, anyone who wants to study these models or use them and benchmark them can you know, put a proposal with the model developers and then they choose some proposal and give them access. So given these three different types of model access, going back to this slide, we can see that you know, this is what, where all these different models fall with given all these three types of access. And again, this is just a snapshot of what it looks like today. And model access can keep changing, even their licenses can keep changing, and model developers can decide to make these changes at any point. So for, to give an example, the Google Palm was first a closed access model, but then it became limited access via the API usage. So this chart here shows 
how progress in you know, the developing the capabilities of machine learning models happens when the model access is open versus closed. So as you can see, for like closed source, the growth is almost linear, like you know, it's linearly with time. But for open source, it's kind of like you know, it lags behind closed source. But then there are pivotal mo like moments that I'm calling pivotal moments that ha happens just before the intersection over there, which is like big releases or open source of research artifacts that helps the open source community, you know, take things. And because there's like a huge community, they can like you know, innovate in different kind of spaces and pockets. And then the growth and innovation like just accelerates. For example, like QLaura, Laura, all these things were happening thanks to um, thanks to open source models. And examples of pivotal moments are like the Meta's Llama and Llama 2, or like you know the Red Pajama from Together, and you know similarly AI 2's Dalma data set. So data set models for like training um, are really like good artifacts that can help accelerate progress in open source. This is great. So what are the tools that are out there that can like help us for like you know understanding and like you know deploying and developing these large language models? So this is like you know just a very small samples of tools that are out there. So today I wanted to like you know zoom into in particular on this one over here which is looking at evaluation of these large language models. Um, so why is evaluation challenging? So it seems like this, these are like you know, press articles from earlier in the year when all these big companies were joining this you know, training a chatbot race. And so you can see that you know, clearly they got like, you know, okay, evaluation was essentially you know, an open and challenging problem. And so let's look into like, you know, why this is the case. And to understand that, we need to step back and understand how training happened so that we can map that to how we should evaluate a chatbot. So here are essentially four types of training that happens for large language models. The first one is pre-training the language model. In this case, you're essentially predicting the next token. And examples of these are like the foundation models such as GPT-3, OPT, Bloom, Llama, Falcon, or Llama 2. The second type of training is in-context learning or prompt-based learning. So in this case, you're doing few-shot learning, but you're not actually updating the parameters of the model. So you just give all the examples that you want the model to perform on a certain task in the context itself, and now you hope that the model learns this new task from the context. And there's something in the middle of which actually updates the parameters and you know, uses the context, and it's called context distillation, which Anthropic uh, you know, put out as research. So, and the third type of training of a language model is supervised fine tuning. So in this case, you are actually giving the model examples of input, which are prompts, and you know, also outputs, the like expected output. And then you fine tune the model for instruction following and to make them chatty and helpful. And examples of these kind of supervised fine tuned models are Instruct GPT, Lambda, OPT, Llama I, and the Llama 2 chat, for example. Also, like uh, you know, the other type of uh, fine tuning is reinforcement learning with human feedback. So in this case, you take human preference data and the fine tune the model using reinforcement learning. And the goal is to nudge the language models towards the values that you desire. In most cases, it's being helpful, honest, and harmless. And example of this is the Llama to Chat model. So let's look at you know how we map you know, training to evaluation. And it seems like for the first two things, like we have these well-known benchmarks, like the Helm benchmark, the Google Big Bench, and even the Hugging Faces Open LLM leaderboard. These are all like automated metrics and benchmarks that are out there. And they are really good for evaluating a model that was trained using the first, or first two steps. But they are not good enough for three and four. And the reason is that, you know, the three and four essentially are the recipes for training a chatbot. And so let's look more into what the steps three and four look like. So if you have seen this uh, you know, figure from the Instruct GPT paper from OpenAI, this essentially shows the steps of you know, taking a model, like a base model, and fine tuning it to make it a chatbot. And so essentially the step three, which on my previous side, which was supervised fine tuning, maps to the helpfulness, so you're optimizing the model for helpfulness. And the step four, which was using reinforcement learning with human feedback, maps to something that you're optimizing the model to be harmless. 
And so in particular, if you wanted to evaluate a, mod, a chat bot, you would have to evaluate uh, instruction following capability. You would have to evaluate the reward model because you are training a model to see both you know, kinds of data that it should you know, steer towards and it should stay away from. And finally, so that is the reward model, which is essentially a classifier. And then the fourth one is doing red teaming because now we have already fine-tuned the model to be harmless. And so you want to adversarially prompt the model to make sure that it actually is aligned with the values you care about. So examples of step one of evaluation, evaluating instruction following would be, does the model actually generate useful responses on a topic, and are they open-ended and chatty? An example is brainstorm a list of New Year's resolution. And for this step, the tools that are out there are, for example, we have the Hugging Faces leaderboard, which uses something called the ELO ratings. And ELO is a metric that is you know, very well known in the chess community because they rate chess players based on like the pairwise, you know, how well they did in certain tournaments. Um, and so here, this leaderboard shows, uh, in a pairwise setting, we asked humans to say, rate responses of models and say which one do they prefer. And you finally do that for a lot of different prompts and model responses, and then you generate ELO scores for them. And so the columns here essentially show like how humans rated these models, and also how GPT-4, as a proxy for human evaluator, rated these models. And clearly, we can see that there's high correlation between using humans for you know, uh, ranking these models or rating these model outputs and using GPT-4 as a proxy for humans in the evaluation setting. Similarly, there's also this very well-known LMSYS leaderboard, which uses very similar idea of pairwise setting of these model responses using ELO ratings. And they have a chatbot arena where anyone can go and prompt a model, and then it, you know, there are two responses from two different models, and then you select which one do you prefer. And they collected almost like million ratings and then you know, generated these ELO rating and a leaderboard out, leaderboard out of it. They also created this very nice data set called the Empty Bench, which is essentially the first dialogue data set of multi-turn dialogue. So, so far we were just looking at given a prompt and looking at the model response and then rating it and evaluating it. But usually there are multiple turns of these dialogues when you're chatting with a chatbot. And so this has like about two turns, and so it has a follow-up question, and then it will rate the output of that question as well. Um, and again, here they are using GPT-4 as an evaluator and asking it to rate on a scale of 1 to 10, where does this model's response fall, and how helpful is the model. So this is a summary of their leaderboard using you know, the, the column, uh, the Arena ELO rating, compared that to the empty bench, which is essentially GPT-4 scoring these models on a scale of 1 to 10. There's also the Stanford's Alpaca Eval Leaderboard, which is again in a similar spirit, trying to like you know you know do models one on one, uh, you know rating and checking the win rate of these models in a pairwise setting. So here they are using GPT-4 as an evaluator, and there al there's also an option to use Claude as an evaluator. Okay, so that's good. So it looks like there seems to be quite a bit of resources and tooling for evaluating the step one. But what about the step two, like uh, you know, evaluating the reward model, which is essentially a classifier that has to choose between a truthful and an untruthful response. So ideally, it would choose a truthful response, and it would rate a you know, more helpful response higher than a less helpful response. And there is really nothing out there, but we have internally in our H4 team, wherein we are working on reinforcement learning with human feedback, and training these models and training reward models, we have an internal leaderboard where we benchmark the reward models that we train, and we use these open source data sets such as the Anthropic Helpful data set, the Open Assistant data set, and so on. And you know, these scores over here are just showing accuracy. And finally, the third step is red teaming, wherein you are crafting adversarial prompts to like surface model vulnerabilities and possible emerging capabilities. For example, you, know, you ask the model, how do I plan a bank robbery, and is it trying to like, you know, give out information and help you plan that? Um, and unfortunately, there is really nothing out there in the open for as a red teaming data set. And this is our blog from a while back, about six months ago, where we put out a call for you know, the community to come together and you know, build a data set for red teaming or a leaderboard. And we were also part of this red, DEF CON red teaming effort that happened a few weeks ago. Okay, so now I wanted to like, you know, talk a little bit about, now we are moving more and more towards 
you know, model evaluation happening and being, you know, replacing humans with GPT-4 or Claude and these large, powerful models. So we actually benchmarked these and we saw how is it, how good is GPT-4 as a proxy for humans when it comes to evaluation. And so clearly we found that there are quirks associated with it. Uh, so GPT-4, for example, has a positional bias and is predisposed to always generate a rating of one in a pairwise preference collection setting. So if you give it two responses and ask it, like, rate which one is better, it will always rate on a scale of one to eight, always give a rating of one. So a model that is likely to come on the left-hand side is more likely to get a higher rating. So you can see the plot. On the left plot, you can see that the one score gets a lot more, like GPT-4 outputs one a lot more. Uh, but humans are more or less uniform across all these different scores, which is what you would like to see. And so when you prompt GPT-4 and say that, hey, you have this bias, be aware of your bias, that you're always likely to generate one, and then you say, like, can you try to debias the result, it actually flips it in the other direction, and now it starts generating a lot more five and six scores. And so that, that's basically a quirky behavior. And then we tried prompting GPT-4 for scoring instead of ranking between the two models, and it alleviates the problem to a little bit. We also found evidence of doping between training and evaluation. So GPT-4 prefers models that are trained on GPT-4-like data, so like longer outputs, even though they might not be as accurate as a human. So for example, GPT-4 would rate human outputs, which are very short and succinct, but very accurate, lower than you know, other model outputs that were trained on these longer prompts and things. So this also like concurs with the results that you know other papers and you know other uh, 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 basically researchers have found that GPT-4 prefers models with higher diversity and high, like longer length of responses. We also found that it has poor correlation with humans on low entropy tasks such as math, coding, and reasoning. So it correlates very well with humans on like very creative tasks like brainstorming or you know generation and all these things. But when it comes to like math and reasoning and all, the correlation goes down where the expected answer is like you know maybe not that uh, you know not high entropy essentially. Um, so yeah, that's about all I have. So the takeaways are um, the open source ML has a huge potential for impact. Think about the chart that I showed. Um, and there is clearly benchmarking gap in evaluating reinforcement learning with human feedback, and especially the reward models, and also in red teaming, so that is model vulnerabilities. And we found, saw, saw that you know, model developers are moving more and more and adopting GPT-4 as a proxy for humans for evaluating and benchmarking their models, but there are clearly quirks associated with it, and we should be aware of that. The quirks you know, we found are that it prefers models that are trained on GPT-4-like data, it has this left positional bias, and it has higher correlation with humans on creative tasks compared to more coding and reasoning tasks. Um, and this is work done with, you know, along with my team at Hugging Face called the H4 team. And that's all I have. Thanks for listening.